Bloody April, or April 1917, was by far the worst time for the Allies during World War I, as far as the air war was concerned, and for good reason. Some of the biggest reasons, however, were simple. The Germans had better trained pilots, and better tactics, and for the most part a better surplus of airplanes which largely included the Albatross D3. Though the British had airplanes like the Sopwith Pup, the Sopwith Triplane, and other airplanes during Blood April, these airplanes were limited in supply and could only be issued in limited numbers. This left a lot of Allied pilots with a very outdated aircraft to use in comparison to what the Germans had access to, like the French Newport 17 or Airco DH-2 Pusher, which in reality were even outdated in comparison to the Albatross D-3. By mid-May and June of 1917, an aircraft came to the scene that would largely change things. A fighter that was more frequently named the Sopwith Camel by the pilots that flew it. The Sopwith Camel was a successor to the earlier Sopwith Pup, with a number of changes that made it more competitive with German fighters like the Albatross D3. The Sopwith Camel came with a 130 horsepower Clergit 9B engine standard, air cooled, it was a rotary piston engine. It had 50 more horsepower than the 80 horsepower Lerone 9C found in the Pup. The Sopwith Camel also had two Vickers 303 machine guns firing through the propeller via synchronizer gear with 500 rounds each. This doubled the firepower of the Sopwith Pup and made it a fighter you didn't want to be down the business end of. Despite these improvements and the added power, the Sopwith Camel only weighed about 950 pounds empty and 1,450 pounds loaded, which made it only slightly heavier than the Sopwith Pup despite the increased power and doubled firepower. The Sopwith Camel was a biplane with two very large wings making it very well surfaced. It had a very short tail which helped it be responsive in pitch, as well as very centralized weight which kept the weight light on the outsides of the airplane which helped its maneuverability. The Albatross D3 had more engine power than the Sopwith Camel. Its 170 horsepower Mercedes D3A engine had roughly 40 more horsepower. But, the Sopwith Camel weighed almost 500 pounds less than the Albatross D3. The Sopwith Camel was also a lot better surfaced than the Albatross D3, giving it a lot better turn, especially in a climbing turn to the left, or a level or diving turn to the right. The Sopwith Camel was also roughly 5 miles an hour faster than the D3 model, had a 200 feet a minute better rate of climb, had a higher service ceiling, and because it wasn't a sesquiplane design, in some cases you could also dive it more aggressively, where the Albatross D3 would be um, more susceptible to shedding its wings. The Sopwith Camel, in the hands of skilled pilots, in combination with other aircraft introduced like the SE-5A and SPAD-13, began to establish air superiority during that time period, the summer of 1917, World War I. The Germans eventually came up with the Albatross D-5, which had a more streamlined fuselage, closer positioned wings, and a more powerful 200 horsepower Mercedes-Benz engine. It however was only a mile an hour faster than the Sopwith Camel, the Clergen 9B model, and it still attained just about every other advantage it had over the previous D-3 model. All D3 was introduced, which could outdive the Sopwith Camel, and was far more robust. But still, the Sopwith Camel could outturn the falls, and could also outrun it, outclimb it, and had a higher service ceiling in some cases. For such a great fighter, it must have some weaknesses, and it did. It in fact had some very big weaknesses, and some very big problems. A lot of problems. One of the bigger damning truths against the Sopwith Camel was it was very difficult to fly. More Sopwith Camels were destroyed on takeoff, landing, and performing maneuvers than were shot down. One of the first issues was the Sopwith Camel didn't necessarily have a throttle. Engine speed could be controlled by controlling the air fuel mixture, but this was a delicate and tedious process that couldn't necessarily be done on takeoff, landing, or in the middle of combat. A more common form of engine control was to blip the engine using a blip switch. This was something that took coordination. If you held the blip switch down for too long, you could shut the engine off completely and it wouldn't restart. 
The Southwest Camel's controls were very interesting. The rudder could be described as somewhat sloppy. The elevator pitch was very sensitive and somewhat over authoritative. But this would come in handy in a dogfight. This wasn't necessarily something good for an amateur pilot who's learning to fly. It also had some adverse yaw effects because of its short tail and long wingspan. They had to be countered with some rudder control during rolls. The biggest issue that plagued the Southwest Camel was the gyroscopic procession created by the large rotary piston engine. The Clergent 9B weighed, weighed roughly 380 pounds. This was roughly a quarter of the Sopwith Camel's fully loaded weight. And this created a lot of what was called gyroscopic procession, which wasn't really a good thing. This had a very odd effect on the airplane. When the airplane was pitched up, it wanted to yaw left slightly. When the airplane was pitched down, it wanted to yaw right slightly. The more aggressively you pitched up, the more it wanted to yaw left, and the more aggressively you pitched down, the more it wanted to yaw right. The gyroscopic effect also affected the airplane in turn. In a very hard banking turn to the left, the airplane's nose wanted to pitch up and climb. The pilot had to apply a lot of left rudder to keep the nose down. In a hard banking turn to the right, the nose wanted to go down, which required very little rudder at all. In fact, sometimes some counter rudder was required in a right-hand turn to keep the nose up. Gyroscopic procession combined with over-responsive control made it a nightmare for a new pilot, especially on takeoff and landing for numerous reasons. On takeoff, the airplane has just enough speed to get off the ground. However, the engine is at max power and is spinning just about as fast as it can, which means the gyroscopic procession is acting very strongly on the airplane. The pilot got too aggressive with the controls on takeoff rather than taking off gently, he'd very easily lose control of the airplane, crash, and die. Landing was a challenge also, because the Sopwith Camel had a very low landing speed which meant crosswinds could really push the airplane. Also because it really didn't have a throttle, the engine was controlled by a blip switch. Once again, you had to not hold the button down too much or too long because you could shut the engine down by accident. You also had to be ready when you landed because sometimes the airplane had a strong tendency to ground loop. One of the smaller criticisms also against the Southwest Camel was that it was also one of the slower airplanes introduced in comparison to some of the other Allied fighters. The Sopwith Camel is only slightly slower than airplanes like the Albatross D5. However, it was greatly slower than airplanes like the SC-5A or SPAD-13, which both had its top speeds exceeding 135 miles an hour. And both airplanes met or exceeded the Sopwith Camel's 1,000 meter, 1000 feet a minute climb rate. However, the Sopwith Camel was considerably more maneuverable than the SPAD and more maneuverable than the SC-5. The Sopwith Camel also had a higher service ceiling than the SC-5 and, well, in some cases was probably safer to maneuver than the SPAD because the SPAD was like a flying brick in some cases. Soon enough, the Germans did begin introducing aircraft that could be more competitive with the Sopwith Camel. By September of 1917, the Fokker F-1, or prototype of the Fokker DR-1 was introduced, and by December of 1917, they began production. They are more readily fielded in the earlier springs of 1918. The Fokker DR-1 was more maneuverable than the Southwest Camel in both roll rate and turn rate. It also had a better rate of climb and a lower stall speed. However, the Southwest Camel was faster and possibly could be dove in a little bit more aggressively than the Fokker DR-1 could. And the Fokker dr one production was discontinued in the spring of 1918 because of production issues. By the summer of 1918, the Fokker D7 was introduced. With a top speed of 117 miles an hour, it was faster than the Clergit 9B powered sop with Camel. And it could dive with it, and was far more robust. It was much more forgiving in a stall as well and easier to fly. But the Sopwith Camel could outturn the Fokker D7 
and can outclimb the Mercedes powered Fokker D7 model. However, in the later summer of 1918, the Fokker D7F with the 240 horsepower BMW 3D and A engine was introduced. This airplane was considerably faster than the Southwest Camel, could not climb the Southwest Camel, and had much better high altitude performance. To dive with the Southwest Camel, the only assured performance benefit the Southwest Camel overhead had with the Fokker D7F was maneuverability at lower altitudes. It would be foolish for a Southwest Camel pilot to even consider facing Fokker D7F at higher altitudes without first engaging it with a serious altitude or energy advantage. Later F1 models of the Sopwith Camel were introduced with a 150 horsepower Bentley BR1 and rotary piston engine. This increased the Sopwith Camel's top speed slightly to 116 to 117 miles an hour, but it more greatly increased the Sopwith Camel's climb rate and high altitude performance due to its higher compression. By the end of World War I, the Sopwith Camel was perhaps the most produced fighter and one of the more successful fighters, shooting down more enemy airplanes than any other Allied fighter during the First World War.